Hello, everyone. Welcome to another version of Right from the Horse's Mouth. And I'm Steve Anderson with Work Camper News. And joining me today is Terry Cooper, the Texas RV professor, better known as Cooper. Welcome, Cooper. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Anderson and it's crew out here. Be, it's, it's nice to be with you this afternoon. We've got lots of folks that are popping in to learn more from uh, you about this topic called the amazing RV refrigerator. And those RVers out there understand there's a lot to know about an RV refrigerator. So I'm not going to burn up any of your time because I want to keep us timely. We're going to jump into this. Mr. Cooper is going to take it and run with the presentation. And then at the end, we're going to open it up for some questions. If you have questions, please feel free to type those in. You've got a little button you can push right there on your little control panel. And when you do that, those questions will show up on my screen and we will share those with Mr. Cooper as he finishes his presentation. So without any further ado, Mr. Cooper, I'm going to drop out of the way and say, take her away. All right. Well, Mr. Anderson, I appreciate it. And folks, I appreciate your time because I know time is precious and I appreciate you taking the time to spend with us this afternoon. So let's just jump in. Now, there's certain ground rules that if, if you've been around very long with us in this, in this RV experience, you know that we have a rule and we believe it's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the things that are going to go wrong with your RV are going to be easy to access and easy to fix if somebody will just show you how. And so my goal today is to be able to show you some of the things that you can do yourself to take care of some of these issues that you may have crop up or might give you an opportunity to share some information with some others in the campground to help them get off that situation to where they're, they're kind of hung up, you know, and keep you out of the shop so that way you can continue to enjoy the RV lifestyle. All right, so here's a trivia question for you. When you look at the outside latches, now, this is the vents on the outside of the RV-style refrigerator. If the latches are on the upside of the panel, they're classified typically as a Norcold, Norcold refrigerator. If they're down, they're Dometic. So up north, or D for down. Now, I say this, and then all of a sudden, somebody pointed out to me the other day, oh, see that one over there? It's got a Dometic stencil on it but yet the latches on the top side so you know don't uh, don't go bet any big bucks on this thing but this has been the pretty much of a standard so every now and then they throw us a curve but typically you can look at the latches and see up north nor cold down south it's a dometic so the thing we need to understand rv refrigerators rv absorption refrigerators are a little bit different than what we have in our brick and stick house now we do have a lot of folks that are using house type refrigerators in their RVs, but it's their lifestyle. And we're gonna, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along here, but I just want you to understand that these absorption type refrigerators have been around since about the middle 1800s, or they had absorption refrigeration back then. Now they have come a long way since then with all the circuit boards and the power that we have and so on. But the key thing, has never changed. You have to have some refrigeration. You've got to have some sort of heat source. It's either going to be an electric heating element or it's going to be a propane flame. Or also you've got to be thinking about you're going to have this airflow. Airflow, airflow. It's totally amazing to me how many times we see situations where these units have been out someplace and they haven't been maintained and they're running hot and you get in there and you find out, you know, you've got wasp nests and you've got all kinds of things that have come in there and they've built their nest or maybe it wasn't installed correctly or insulation fell down. It's blocking the airflow. So we're going to look at some of that here in just a little bit. But first, I want us to look at just the basics of RV absorption refrigerator. Okay. But because it does not have a compressor, we're having to go about this thing totally different. In other words, we're having to use heat and this heat flow in order to get the cold. So yes, what we're going to do is we're going to take heat and we're going to make cold. And basically what they're going to do when you and I hook this thing up either to propane or the 120 volt heating element, or some of you may even have a 12 volt heating element which you typically see what we call a three-way, which would have propane, 120 volts, or 12-volt heat, uh, heating elements. You would typically see those in something like the Class C motorhomes or maybe even the Class B. And the reason being that the 12-volt is not as common is because they consume so much power, and so they have to have an alternator or a generator feeding it. 
So in our world, and part of the reason why RV air conditioners and RV refrigerators, while they do cooling, they operate totally different because with air conditioners, we're going to use a compressor to move that gas. With a refrigerator, what we're going to do is we're going to use heat to convert that liquid, turn it into a vapor or gas. Then we're going to strip some heat off of it. And as we convert and pull some of that heat off of it, what we're going to do then is we're going to run it into the freezer. Now, here's the thing we've got to remember. One of the laws of thermodynamics that we deal with is, is that heat travels to cold. Heat travels to cold. And if you don't believe me, go sit on those aluminum bleachers on a Friday night at a football game and you don't have that cushion to sit on. Well, you and I both know what happens when that cold, cold blue northern blows in and we're sitting there with aluminum seats. It's going to suck all the heat out of our back and our bottom and everything else, right? So what happens is, is that we've got this refrigerant, it's hydrogen, water, ammonia, and sodium chromate. Now the water, hydrogen, and ammonia are actually the things that, that we're using and we're going to adjust it through these coils and these tubes on the back of this, this refrigerator, <clears throat> that they meter it so that way in certain areas they're gonna drop in more ammonia, other places are gonna drop in more hydrogen. They're also gonna run some of these gases through an orifice. And what we know is, is that when you go from a high pressure where you got this little bitty hole and you're trying to push this gas through it, when it comes in on the other side, when it comes into that bigger chamber where it's past that restriction, what takes place then is, is that we drop our pressure. And another law that we deal with is, is that when you have a gas in a sealed container, if you apply heat to it, you will raise the pressure. If you raise the pressure on it, you also raise the heat. So they work hand in hand. And so what happens with this refrigerant, we're gonna heat it with a heating element or the propane flame. And what we're going to do is we're going to boil it. Then we're going to take it through an area where we're going to separate, and, and, and really they call it a fancy water separator, but all it is is little dimples in the tube, so that way as that gas comes by, if there's little molecules of water still in that gas, they have a tendency to attach themselves to that rough spots, those dimples of those coils. And so what happens is it starts developing little water droplets and drops it back down. Then we're going to take it through what they call a condenser. Now, this is the same thing as a radiator on an automobile. All we're going to be doing is getting heat to slough off because what we're going to do is we're going to run this, for, we're going to run this gas through this condenser on the inside of the tubes, and then we're going to run air across the outside of the tubes and the fins to get that heat exchange to move it on. Now, keep in mind, if we do not get rid of that heat, we cannot go get more heat in the freezer and the refrigerator. And so as we're going to be looking through, I'm gonna make some, some very pointed suggestions that you and I need to be looking at with our RVs and to make sure they're being maintained. Uh, even though they don't have any moving parts, they still have things that have to be done to them. So after we run that, that refrigerant through that condenser coil, we strip some heat. Next thing we do is we take those coils that are making contact with the back wall of the freezer. And because that gas is cold, it's actually colder than what it is in the freezer. It sucks heat out of the freezer and absorbed it into that gas. Then we take it down a little further and we then make it make contact with those aluminum fins inside the refrigerator. Those of you that have RVs, you've probably looked in the, open that refrigerator door and you look down at it and see, you know, trying to get you a soft drink or an adult beverage out of there. And you say, what are what all those aluminum fins are? It looks like just, I mean, there's a little, what, what is the deal? Well, what they're there for is, and I'm gonna call them, they're basically heat vacuum cleaners. So what we're doing is, is we've got those fins inside the compartment and what it's doing is because the gas on the back side of those fins is still craving heat, it's going to pull it out of that box. Now, it won't pull out as much as what it pulled out of the deep freeze because the gas doesn't have the capacity because it's already absorbed some of the temperature out of the freezer. But when it drops down to that refrigerator, it's going to pull it. And typically what we expect is the temperature difference between a freezer and a refrigerator, the drop between those two is going to be somewhere around about 30 degrees. 
Now, don't get hung up on that because there's always some variances that go with it. But just remember, the freezer obviously is going to be colder than the refrigerator. Okay. Now, we talk about airflow, remember? Now, one of the things we have to keep in mind is, particularly in some of the heat that we've been having, heat outside temperature is going to sometimes drive these refrigerators crazy if we do not have good airflow across the coils on the back. Because remember, we've got to get rid of that heat off those condensers. So let's, let's look at the, the drawing over on the left hand side excuse me, on the left-hand side. Now, this configuration is typically where, maybe it's like the kitchen, the refrigerator's in a slide. So basically what happens is you get there wherever you're going, you push the button and that slide out goes out. Well, because we do not have the ability to have a roof vent, all of the vents have to be on the sidewall. So you can see down, down low where it says lower vent, cool air in, and then it travels up back behind the coils, and then it exits out the upper vent. There is a very strategic thing that has to be done to these. In other words, the space between what we call the baffle or the baffle box and the coils is going to be about one half of an inch. And what I always tell everybody, take your hand and hold it up and get a hold of your knuckles. And that space between where your fingers start on the knuckles on the back side of your palm, that's the space that should be no more than that. Now, I've gone in and looked at RVs before, and there's so much space behind that refrigerator, because now we're looking at it from the outside. We take that bottom panel off. There's so much space behind that refrigerator, you literally get your head up in there. So what's happening is when you have all that excessive space, that air goes to the path of least resistance. It says, I don't want to get that heat. I want to go on through here and pass out and go on to the upper vent. But what we wanted to do is do some work for us. So by having this refrigerator up close to that back wall, no more than a half inch, what we're doing is we're forcing the air that's coming in the bottom come out the top. Now, many of these refrigerators will also have little fans. They look like little computer fans, and they have a temperature sensor that's hooked onto the condenser coil. And that temperature sensor will say, okay, it's getting too warm. We need to turn on the fans to power assist the airflow. So what you're dealing with here is airflow coming out. So anything that blocks or restricts the air from going across the coils and coming out the top is going to slow down the airflow. If we slow down the airflow, that means we don't remove as much heat. If we don't remove as much heat out of the gas, then that means the gas cannot go back to the refrigerator and get more heat out of the groceries or whatever you put in the fridge and then whatever you put into the freezer, okay? Now, if you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, you'll see the airflow coming in at the bottom, but notice how it exits on the roof, on the top. Typically, this is a, a refrigerator configuration where the refrigerator is built into a set of cabinets and you've got one vent on the outside. And then if you look up on the roof, you'll see that long, narrow vent right alongside the edge of the, of the sidewall. Now, this is honestly one of the most efficient ways to move heat, bring it in from the side and exhaust it out the top because you have the natural airflow of it rising. But here again, we've got to make sure that air goes across those coils. And because what happens is, is that if you get outside and you're someplace that, say, the temperature is 90, 95 degrees and you have poor airflow across the coils, what will happen is, is that as the temperature starts warming up outside the ambient temperature, as it begins to rise, it also raises the temperature inside the box because the box is not getting rid of its heat through the coils because some of that heat is still being trapped in the gas. So it's, it's saturated. It says, I can't cake anymore. I'm trying to handle what I have, but they're not giving me good airflow. So I want you to think about these refrigerators. And so if you have one and you're saying, well, let's just we'll take a look at ours, take that bottom louver off, that vent louver off, and take a look and see what the space is between the refrigerator and that back wall. No more than a half inch, which is the thickness of your hand, okay? And so just think of this, if you do not have good airflow, it's like having a Walmart shopping bag on the front grill of your automobile or your truck, and we know what happens to that engine. It's going to get hot because it's no airflow to move that heat, okay? Now, the question a lot of times comes up, well, 
how level do these refrigerators have to be? Because we always hear that, okay, the refrigerator has to be level. Well, it is. When I first got started in this business many, many, many years ago, there was an old man that I was working with, and man, this guy, he just had a ton of knowledge, but he had a warped sense of humor. He just kind of a very dry humor kind of guy. And I remember asking him one time, you know, now, how do I know this refrigerator's level, this RV's level? And he looked at me like I had a horn growing out my forehead or something. And he said, Cooper, you know what unlevel looks like. He said, if you have to put your foot on the wall so that way you can stay in bed, then you know the RV is unlevel. Well, that's not quite what I was looking for. But in today's world, you and I have our cell phone and we can get a leveling app. And if you just want to put that leveling app right there on the bottom of the floor of the uh, of the deep freeze. And, and now what I've done is I've just shown you my cell phone and the app, the leveling app that I have. And you can see that you got, now I like to use the little round one because you've got the little bubble in the middle. Now, as you can see this picture when it was taken, it wasn't quite ready, but as long as that bubble has probably, I'm going to say three quarters of the bubble is inside that round circle, that inner circle where the crosshairs meet, then you should be fine. No problem at all. Now, some of you say, well, I don't want to put my cell phone in there. Well, you can go to one of the big box stores like Home Depot or Lowe's or Ace Hardware and everything and buy you one of those little six inch carpenters levels and just lay it right there on the floor of the deep freeze and see what it looks like. Now, what you want is that bubble to be between the two bullet lines, the two lines that uh, that tell you what's going on there. And it won't take you long. You lay it in and say, oh, okay, we're fine. And you'll find real quick that you can be pretty accurate. Now, those of you that have the electronic leveling system, you know, like the Swin, uh, not Swintech, but the uh, Lippard leveling system and some of, the, some of the other guys, a lot of times those units will level and you won't have any problem. But those of you that are in units that maybe you have to manually level your units or you have stabilizer jacks, this can be a critical thing for you because if you do not have this unit level, what will happen is that sodium chromate that's in that, that gas mixture, it's a powder. And that sodium chromate, they, they borrowed it from the oil industry. And one thing you got to find out about us here in the RV industry, we may not be the sharpest sticks in, in the box, but by golly, we know how to swipe and deploy. And so this, this RV industry has borrowed a lot of things from the marine industry, and now they're borrowing things from the petroleum industry. And so what they do is they use this sodium chromate to coat the inside of the coils of this refrigerator to keep it from rusting because it's raw steel and you figure you've got water, you've got ammonia, and you've got hydrogen. All of those things are going to attack the inside of those coils. So what happens is they use that sodium chromate. Now, if this RV is unlevel, what's going to take place is, is that all the liquid's going to go off and leave the sodium chromate powder. So now when you and I are, we fire up our refrigerator and, we, and it's unlevel, whether we're running propane or we're running electric heating element, what's going to take place is that powder is going to begin to crystallize and it's going to be like uh, a blood clot in the human body. And so what will happen is, is that this blood clot will now begin to start forming and, it'll, and just little pieces of it will flake off and it'll begin to start traveling with the gas and floating around. And so what will happen is it will soon start to block up the orifices and the, and the inside of the cooling coils. Now, when you think about the sodium chromate crystallizing, it's not something that just happens overnight. It's usually an accumulative thing. And where we typically see this is where people maybe have a driveway in their home and they bring their RV home and they're going to set it up so they can get, you know, get it to cool down. And then maybe the driveway has got a pretty good little slope on it. Well, if you do that many times, what happens is, is that you fire it up, say, well, I want to run it 12 to 24 hours to get it to cool down. Well, what happens is that sodium chromate over a period of time begins to crystallize and then it floats around and accumulates. Now, there's a lot of people out there that will say, well, you know, we'll just take that refrigerator loose and we'll go put it in the back of a pickup and we'll go burp it. And what they're thinking is, is that the strategy is get this thing out on a rough highway and bounce it around and jar that sodium chromate crystal loose. And you can many times, you can. But the only problem is that sodium chromate is still crystallized and it will never go back to the powder again. So even if you dislodge it, 
and the refrigerator starts working for you. It will only be a very short period of time between before that crystallization starts coming back around and it'll block up the orifices again. Now, typical symptom that you will see is the deep freeze will be super cold like it's supposed to be, but the refrigerator won't cool at all, or maybe it's up around 50 or 60 degrees. Now think about what we know, as that gas travels up, goes through that condenser, then the first place it goes to is the freezer. Well, it's got, hey, I got, I got opportunity to absorb heat, and that's what it does. Then it starts traveling, and all of a sudden it hits one of those blocks, those barricades, and it can't get into the refrigerator compartment. And so guess what? There's no way to siphon heat out of that refrigerator. And so then all of a sudden we're dealing with an issue that we got a great working deep freeze, but not so good refrigerator. And Lady E and I had a big four-door unit one time. And that's the problem we had. And I pretty much knew that that's what had happened is whoever had, had that unit before us had had some, had done a little bit of abuse to it. And we ended up having to replace the coils on the back. Now, things I want you to look at. Voltage is required to make these RVs operate. Now, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit and, and just share something with you. If this refrigerator has a circuit board on it, now, there are some that are mechanical, and you'll typically see them the small Class Bs and some of the little uh, A-frame or the pop-up tent campers, and they have manual controls, and they do not have a circuit board. But by far, most of us, you and I, probably have RVs that have circuit boards. You know, if you've got all the lights that come on when you open the door and you got the, the lighted LED, I guarantee you, you've got a circuit board there. Now, that circuit board has to have deep cycle, 12 volts. No, it's, it's a house voltage, 12 volts like we have in the RV to run the lights, you know, the LED lights and the exhaust fans and things like that. These refrigerators, regardless of what function, heating element or propane flame, the circuit board has to have good 12 volts off the battery in order for it to tell the circuit board what to do so that way it can obey your commands when you tell it and you push the button on the front panel, I need you to be propane, that the thing will switch over, the circuit board will switch the refrigerator over and, and help it to light the propane flame. Then if you push the button, say I want 120 volts, then what will happen is, is that the circuit board will see that and say, oh, they want to run off of the heating element here. Okay, so bad batteries or batteries that set up over the winter, things like this, dirty connections, uh, wires that are, you know, have poor connections, the wire nuts have fallen off, the wires have come apart. All of these things cause the... Uh, the refrigerator not to function like we need it to because it has to have a good 12 volt circuit board. Now, those of you that are in this experience, I'm gonna ask you to take the time and look at your refrigerator. Many of you will have a data plate. You open the door and there's a data plate on the column and it'll have the model number and it'll also have the serial number. You need to jot that information down or take a picture with your cell phone. Then I want you to go to your computer and I want you to Google or however you do your with your search engines and key in that particular brand. So if it's Norcold, then put in Norcold Recall and see what it pops up. It will take you to a site and you key in the serial number and the model number and it will tell you if your refrigerator is due for a recall. Same thing with Dometic. Take the serial number. And, the, and, the, and, and go ahead and Google it, bring it up from the Dometic site, put in the serial number and the model number, and it will tell you if you need to have a recall kit. These recall kits, and I've got pictures of them here, as you can see in the one that says Dometic Recall, all it is is a temperature sensor that is feeling the temperature of the boiler of where we're actually converting that liquid into a vapor. If it gets too hot, what it will do is it will interrupt the power from the battery going to the circuit board. Now, what happens is, is that if these refrigerators, if you're in a really hot place and they start getting too hot, many times that thermal switch will trip and interrupt the power. Now, the Norcold one is a little different. So than having a push switch, switch, it actually has a little module and inside that module, it has a little uh, relay and you reset it with a magnet. You just, if that little red light above that green wire, you see that little red LED there? Uh, 
if that little light turns red, that means that it has tripped and it's basically killed the power to the circuit board. So all you have to do is take a magnet. Now, these little refrigerator magnets are not quite strong enough, but if you've got a, a good screwdriver that's got a real strong magnet on it, many times you can just wave it real close and just rub it right on the surface where that little red LED light and it'll trip it and reset it for you. Brings that relay and puts it back into place, light goes out. Uh, you can go down to a place like Harbor Freight or, or, or any of these hardware stores and you can buy just little magnets where you, you know, that you, that you can put things on uh, metal. Uh, a lot of folks will buy them, particularly school teachers. They like to put them so they can hang up papers on the wall and things like that. But these little disc magnets work really great for it to reset it. Okay. Now, let's just say the refrigerator is not working on 120 volts. OK, this is a very common thing. It's not working on 120 volts. In other words, you've, it works great on propane. It cools and everything. But when you switch it over to 120 volts, it just doesn't work. Now, I had a gentleman send me a note one time. He said, Cooper, he said, it's working on propane, but it's not working when I run off the 120 volts. And then he said, do you think it might be a bad cooling coil on the back of the refrigerator? Now, think about it. It cooled on gas, but it didn't cool on electric heating element. So what we know is, is the circuit board has got 12 volts coming to it because at least it made its change and went from one function to the other. But we also know that the cooling coils are fine and working because they worked in one function, they just don't work in the other. And so these are the most common things that you're going to see. Where there's a trip circuit breaker in the panel box, because many times that receptacle that's on the back side of that compartment where that refrigerator is, that circuit breaker that's feeding it is maybe also feeding something else inside the RV and somebody may have tripped that circuit breaker, which in turn knocks out your refrigerator. So what happens is say maybe somebody plugged into receptacle and it was too much and that receptacle is tied into the receptacle where the refrigerator is and maybe they plugged in there, say their blow dryer and it tripped the circuit breaker in the panel box. Well, guess what? Yeah, you, you killed power to the receptacle in the living room or wherever you were plugged into, but you also killed power to your refrigerator as well. And all you have to do is go over there and turn that circuit breaker off and turn it back on to reset it. Turn it off and reset it by going back on. Now you're going to also see situations where people they're going to get in there and it's typically what we call the putter butt. Now putter butt's usually some old man that doesn't have anything to do and and the wife is he's retired and the wife sends him outside because please go do something you're getting in my hair and you know I, I since you've been retired you've just been you know just been underfoot too much. So Mr. Putter Butt doesn't know much about RVs. He'll go out there with his little vacuum and he'll be vacuuming things out because he says I got to keep this clean. And he unplugs the refrigerator. Well, when he unplugs the refrigerator, he's just now disabled the 120 volts going to the circuit board. So even though the circuit board switched over from propane looking for 120 volts, it's not coming because it's not plugged into the receptacle. Okay. Those are the two most common things you'll see. And you know what? When it happens to you, don't tell anybody. Okay. Don't tell anybody. Because I can't tell you how many times I've had stuff like that happen to me. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out and made service calls. All I had to do is plug that thing in. Voila, we're good. So while I'm there, I'm over doing some additional cleaning because the customer obviously has some issues there or, or, or the putter butt. And usually your putter butt's looking over your shoulder and he's wanting to know what are you doing, how's that work and everything. And, and so when you plug it in, you look at him and he looks at you, but you never tell the wife what you've done. Okay, because when you go in to get your check, you will have already gone in there, cleaned the burner assembly, and got some other things cleaned up. And so when Maud, that's typically the lady's name, when you Maud's writing the check for you, you're going to say, she's going to ask you, well, what'd you find? I said, oh, Maud, it just needed a little maintenance. That's all it needed. Because if you throw that old man under the bus, there will go your client. Because Mr. Putterbutt will do other things to that RV, and if you stay in good with Maud and, and Harold, which is his name, then you'll be doing a lot of business. He'll be a steady Eddie customer. He'll break more stuff than you can fix over a period of time. Okay, so just don't don't throw Harold under the bus. Sometimes you may even have a blown fuse on the circuit board. It's a glass cartridge fuse, 120 volts. Uh, if you have blown that fuse 
be sure and check that electric heating element. Now, as you can see the green circle, you can see where that is called a candy can heating element and it's making contact with the boiler assembly. And that's how we train, that's how we transfer the, the heat. Because usually if you've blown a 120 volt fuse, something caused it to go. And the only thing that's between that fuse and the boiler is that heating element. So if you have a, if you find that you've got a blown fuse there, just go over and make sure that you ohm out and you test that heating element to make sure that you don't have something that went defective on you. Because if you put another fuse in without making sure the heating element's good, you may be blowing another fuse. And uh, you know, there's no sense in that. While you're there, double check it and make sure. All right, so Things that, and some of the questions that Mr. Anderson shared with me was is some things that some of you folks wrote in and said, well, okay, tell us about how long does it take to cool down? Because this unit does not have a compressor, it takes longer for it to cool down, somewhere between 12 to 24 hours. And all of that's based upon the outside ambient temperature. How hot is it out there? Okay. So that's the reason why a lot of times people will fire up the refrigerator, bring it home with them, park it in the driveway, let it cool down a day or two before they put their groceries in it, okay? Now keep in mind, if, you, if you're new to this experience, you'll realize real quick that your ice cream will stay soft. The deep freeze in most RV refrigerators does not get cool enough. Now every time I say that, somebody will send me a note, say, well, mine does. Well, you've got, you're kind of the exception to the rule. But by far, most of the RV style refrigerators are not like our house type refrigerators and they just don't get cool enough. We typically expect the temperature range inside the, the, the freezer to be somewhere between negative 10 and positive 10, okay? Which is fine for your steaks and things like that, but just realize those things that have a lot of butter fat in them, like ice cream, they just don't freeze. They get soft, kind of like a dairy, you know, an ice cream cone that you get at one of the Dairy Queen or someplace like that. Now, the refrigerator temperature, we typically see it somewhere between 34 and 48. Now, Lady E, my wife, she's the, uh, the RV kitchen lady. She does a lot of seminars with us at RV shows and things, and she had, she had owned her own, her own business. She'd owned a little restaurant. And let me just tell you, you say 48 degrees to her and she spazzes out because it's kind of like, no, things begin to start breaking down and deteriorating. So what you really want to do is get that thing between 34 and about 41. And Lady E is really big about having a thermometer hanging on the shelf in that refrigerator, that top shelf. So that way you kind of keep an eye on it because you don't want things to go start going bad in your refrigerator. But the ranges, these are the ranges that we're typically looking at, okay? Now, some of you will have adjustments that you can make and some of you don't. Now, the picture on the left is a fixed in place thermostat. In other words, the only controls, the way that you can change the temperature for this refrigerator is the front dial. Now, we call that the human interface. They are, you know, they are there that you and I turn on the refrigerator, we can play with it, and we have the ability to dial it down. So what happens is this thermistor, this thermostat is crimped onto the fins. Now, these are the fins that are sucking the heat out of the refrigerator. On the back side of those fins is the back wall where the coils are for, for that we were looking at a while ago. So if you need to make changes to the temperature inside that box, you're going to have to probably adjust the front panel to make things happen. Now, there are some of you that are going to have an adjustable thermostat. Now, what they have is this little plastic clip on these fins, and they have a thing called, they call a, a thermistor. And all it is is a solid-state device that's built in. Is as it gets warmer, it changes its resistance, which in turn, uh, how do I say this? It, it limits the flow of the voltage going back to the circuit board. So basically the circuit board on the back of this RV refrigerator is going to send voltage up on one wire to this thermistor and based upon the temperature inside the box is going to determine how much of that voltage goes back to that circuit board to trigger to tell it to come on or, or go off, okay? Now, if you need to make it colder, you're going to move the thermostat or the thermistor upwards into the warmer compartment. 
because we all know that heat travels up, right? So what happens is what you're going to end up doing is, is you're going to move the thermistor upwards and, and, and move it in small increments, half inch, no more than three quarters every time you move it. And when you move it up, you're moving the thermistor into a warmer zone, which is then going to change the resistance of that thermistor and allow more voltage to pass through going back to the circuit board and cause it to trigger and turn on whether it's the heating element or it happens to be the propane flame. Okay. Now let's say that things are freezing up in the refrigerator. In other words, your lettuce has got, you talk about iceberg lettuce, you have it frozen, right? The strawberries are now just chunks. Well, obviously, it's gotten too cold. So what you're going to do is you're going to bring this thermistor down. Now, sometimes these fall off, little road vibration, they fall off. All you have to do is to clip it back onto the fin and then put your little, watch your thermometer there in your deep freeze, or not in your deep freeze, but in your refrigerator and come and check it about every 12 hours. So what you're going to do is you're going to adjust it up and down, trying to get it in that range of that 34 to 41 degrees. Once you get it dialed in, all you have to do is take a magic marker or you know, a felt tip pen and mark where that, that little plastic clip needs to be. I know some people even take a paper binder or a paper clip and clip it on there so it doesn't bounce off anymore. But once you get it dialed in, what's working for you, then mark it so that way if it gets bumped by a beverage or a road bump or whatever, then that way you can put it back like it was and you don't have to adjust it. But what you're going to end up doing is, is that you may have to play with it a couple of days to get it where you can dial it in by moving it up and down that fan to get it where you need it to be, where it's the right temperature inside the box. Now, a lot of folks will put saran wrap and aluminum foil on the shelves. When you do that, you limit the airflow inside that box. There are no fans built into these refrigerators. It's not like our brick and stick refrigerator. So what happens is, is that if you put that aluminum foil, the air doesn't flow and everything just sinks to the bottom. Now, Ideally, particularly if you're one of those individuals that likes to pack your refrigerator, or maybe you live full time in and you need, you know, you've got to have more groceries in it, go out and buy you one of these little battery operated fridge fans. Now, you can buy them off of Amazon. Sometimes you can see them at some of the RV stores. They just have some D cell batteries. You put it in the bottom of the box. And what it does is it takes that cold air as it's dropping down on it, it throws it back up. And so what you're doing is you're creating the circulation that you need to move around the groceries. Now, did you know for every minute that refrigerator door is left open, it takes one hour to recover its temperature? Now, this picture is a picture. Her name is Chloe. Chloe is one of my favorite ladies here in the RV park. She always loves to come up and give Uncle Cooper a hug. And she has to show me all the paintings that she does. Well, I got to talking to her mom and daddy, and I said, could I have a picture of Chloe holding the refrigerator door open? And so they did. I said, don't want her face, just showing the door. And so they sent me the picture last night. And so Chloe now is a professional model because I'm going to give her $5 for her picture that we're seeing right here. But she is such a doll. And I just love talking to this little girl. So when I bet when mom and daddy told her that Cooper needs her to open the door so they could take a picture, I bet they all had a good laugh at our expense today. But I wanted you to see this is typically what happens. Adults and children both leave the door open, and for every minute that it's left open, it takes an hour for it to, to recover, okay? So if you're one of those that's traveling in a motorhome, put your things in the ice chest so that way you can stay cold and then kind of restrict the getting into the refrigerator, okay? Now, do you travel with your propane on or do you travel with your propane off? I have had some serious discussions at some of these rallies, particularly where the older guys are. They are so adamant about, oh, I've never had a problem. I travel with my motor home, I, and I just leave my propane on. And you just, yeah, okay. And, and I think to myself, well, you know, we've all, you know, we've all went over the speed limit, but we haven't always been caught. Well, I feel the same way, except propane being on is a dangerous thing. I have seen some situations where RVs, brand new RVs were brought into a dealership and they, the technicians called me aside and said, Mr. Cooper, you need to look at this. You're always saying you want good pictures. And they showed me where the flexible rubber gas line that goes from the slide out to the box 
or to the frame, as I should say, it had these hoses had dropped down and the tires had rubbed a hole in them. And like one of the technicians said, there's two of these. So, and we got to look at the serial numbers. They were just one serial number apart. So somewhere in the production line, someone didn't tie those gas lines up. And so when they transported them from Elkhart, Indiana to Dallas, Texas, in that transportation, they had literally wore a hole in the gas line. And the only way they found it was, is the technicians were doing a propane drop test. They were doing a leak test and it showed up big time. So when you look at it, you think, okay, well, that doesn't happen that often. But notice also what's underneath this slide out those tires. Imagine you've got all your wiring going up for that kitchen because this is a slide out. For, you can see where the refrigerator is. So you've got the gas line, you've got all the electrical lines, and if you have an ice maker, you've got a water line there. And so if you happen to have a blowout, all that steel belt is just wrapping around that stuff and it's just beating it to death, tearing those gas lines. If that refrigerator has its propane turned on and feeding gas to it, then what we have is a gas flow. And if all we need is some sparks from that steel belt of that tire, throwing sparks off the pavement, next thing you know, we'll have a major fire. Now we also see situations, and we had a, a gentleman in one of our classes, uh, we were doing a class down in New Bronzeville, and he had an outdoor kitchen, very similar to what you're seeing right here. And directly underneath it, by the frame, they have a quick connect to hook up the gas line. And he was late to class, and when he got there, he was all dirty, and you could tell he'd been out crawling around and that thing. And he said, I had a blowout, and he said the blowout was right next to the kitchen. And he said when it come unraveled, it got a hold of that gas line, and it stretched it like a rubber band. And he said the only thing that saved me was I had not turned on the propane. Because he said, if I had turned on the propane and that tire come loose, he said it shredded everything underneath there, tail light wiring, uh, you know, electrical lines, and he said, and also that gas line stretching it. When you see things like that, it makes a believer out of you. Now, those of you that travel are going to be traveling to the East Coast over there in Virginia. Um, you know, there are some bridges and also some tunnels that they require you to turn off the propane. So please turn the propane off because it makes a world of difference for you and the safety of you and your family. Now, if you want to live on the on the ragged edge there and say, ah, you know, it won't ever happen to me, well, think about what's happening to the circuit board on this refrigerator. Now, the back of the refrigerator, let's look at the picture here on the left. You see that louvered panel down at the bottom. On the other side of that louvered panel is the refrigerator and the circuit board and the propane flame. If you're operating propane on this, what happens is that wind blows in as you're driving down the highway. So say you're going 60, 65 mile an hour, that wind is blowing in and many times it blows out the flame of that propane uh, refrigerator. So the refrigerator is built with a circuit board where it senses that flame went out and it's going to relight. Blows the flame out again, it relights. I have replaced numerous circuit boards that the relay was worn out. And the only reason why it was worn out, because the unit was not that old, the units were not that old, is because somebody left their propane on while they were traveling. And as they traveled, the wind was blowing out. The circuit board says, oh, I've got to relight. So on, off, on, off, on, off. So through a period of time, the circuit board was worn out because the relay on it was gone because of the wind blowing out the flame in the burner assembly. Now, let me throw this trivia question at you here. We got a call from one of the manufacturers and they were sharing with us, said uh, we got a call around Thanksgiving last year. This couple had bought this big motor home and they have our model of refrigerator. It's a big four door. Now, this was the first Thanksgiving this family had been on the road. So the lady went down and bought one of those big turkeys, frozen turkeys and put it in the refrigerator and she was going to thaw it out just like she'd always done for years and years when she had family because she decided just because they were on the road didn't mean they couldn't, they couldn't go ahead and continue to have Thanksgiving. Well, they had called the helpline at this uh, manufacturer of this particular refrigerator and said, Something's gone wrong with our refrigerator. This does not make sense. Everything is cold in the refrigerator, but the meat and all of the things that we have in the freezer are thawing out. 
Now I'm going to back up a couple of slides here. I want to show you some things. Okay. There's Miss Chloe again. Now just imagine you got this frozen you got this frozen turkey in the refrigerator, thawing it out. What's happening on the inside of that refrigerator as it's thawing out? It maintains the cold. If it maintains the cold, because it's trapped in there, because the door is closed, where's that cold going and what's it affecting? The thermostat or the thermistor, right? So if it affects that thermistor, that thermostat, what's it telling that circuit board? telling it not to do. It says, hey, it's plenty cold down here where we are. There's no need in turning on and giving us any propane flame to make cold or turning on the heating element. Well, the deep freeze didn't see that. It's not getting any of that cold. So what was happening there, that big old frozen turkey was, called, was faking that thermostat out. Now, I say this to share with you. Many of you will say, well, we're, we're, we didn't get a chance to go our typical 12 to four, uh, 24 hours, let it cool down. We'll just stop and buy some bag of ice and we'll put it in the freezer. I'm going to say we will put it in the refrigerator. So you buy, say, two or three 10-pound bags of ice, put them on the shelves in the, in the refrigerator because you want to start cooling it down. What is that ice telling that thermostat? just like that butterball turkey. Now, if you're concerned about anything freezing or needing to be still kept cool and freezing, put the bag of ice in the freezer till you get it up to speed, but do not put it in the refrigerator because it will fake out that thermostat and that thermostat will tell the circuit board, hey, everything's happy. We're in good shape, no need to come on. So the Coopers do not travel with propane on. And I can take you to Waco, Texas and show you where there used to be a Texaco station where a couple pulled in with a fifth wheel and they had come in from the valley and they were heading up to Mich Michigan and they had their refrigerator on. He went in to get fuel. While he was paying for it, there was a major explosion, blew out the glass in the building, the canopy overhead fell down, there was cars and everybody around there, nobody was hurt, I mean, nobody was killed, a few people got a little glass cut. And when all said and done, they come back and said, sir, you had your refrigerator on, and when it sparked, there happened to be gas fumes around you from all the people pumping fuel, and you were the ignition source. So needless to say, this gentleman and his insurance company had to pay for this propane, for all the vehicles that were, that were damaged because of the propane explosion. And the gentleman on the Texaco station said he didn't want any more of this. And he basically had them come in and they bulldozed that little service station, pulled the fuel tanks out of the ground, brought in gravel, and they now are storing forklifts and uh, road graders and other equipment at a rental yard because there used to be a Texaco station that is no more there. It's no longer there because they had a little propane explosion because somebody pulled in with propane refrigerator turned on. Okay. So with that being said, Mr. Anderson asked me to share with you this material, but I, I would be amiss if I didn't also say, Hey, we just barely scratched the surface. There's so much more. There's so much more. So if you're looking to learn more about how you can take care of your own rig, or maybe you want to just be familiar enough to help others when you're traveling, or maybe you want to start a career. Well, we have 15,000 square foot training facility here in Athens, Texas. We're just outside of Dallas, about an hour southeast of downtown Dallas. And we have specifically built this RV training facility on an RV park. So that way people can come and stay in their RV, live there, and walk to class, and we'll work with them, taking them through how to become an RV technician or how to become an RV inspector. Did you know that you can have an RV inspection, get a home inspection on your RV? Now, this is the, these are the inside of the 15,000 square foot. The picture on the left is some of the classrooms. We have three classrooms. 30 by 30. You can see we have four service bays that we bring RVs in. And let me just tell you, with COVID-19 that we've had here recently and this heat, being inside this building has been a pleasure. We have actually set this facility up where we have the social distancing and in air conditioning so that way people didn't have to go out in the hot broiling sun and they could do all their tests and do their uh, learn how things work, take things apart and do it in the air conditioned building and not out there in that 100 degree temperature. 
Now, this picture here is a roof inspection of where a gentleman's name is Howard, Howard Jar Jars, and his wife, as you see in the center picture, her name is Pam. She has the yellow top. And Howard is doing a demonstration on, on top of one of the RVs. There's no way you could get all these students on top of that RV. So what we have done is we built a canopy, I mean a catwalk with handrails, so that way people can lean up against it and see what he's doing. And he also has a GoPro camera that he can get up real close and show you things and broadcast it to the television in the picture on the right hand side. And so by being this detailed, we can make sure that it makes sense to you before you leave. Now, one of the things that we do is we have this five-day class. This is the what we call the RV maintenance class. And that's what Howard was showing you there, and that's what we were doing with those RVs in the building. The RV maintenance class takes you through the all the systems of the RV, the refrigerators, the, the air conditioners, the, uh, the uh, voltage for 120 volts, the 12 volt system, because there's three electrical systems in these RVs. Then we do the water, and then we do the propane, and then we show you the key things that you're going to see with all the appliances. Now, the thing about it is if you come and spend time with us for that five days, because I will tell you it's pretty intense, but it's hands on. But you also have the ability to come back in one year and to repeat the information. It doesn't cost you anything because what we have found is you learn, you go out and apply, and you come back and relearn. Make sure you got all the things plugged in. So we give you the ability to come back. And we, we have been doing this since the very beginning when we were doing training when we were traveling around the country with uh, Steve and Kathy Jo Anderson. We just found that people, if you give them an opportunity, they will say, you know what, I think I got it. I'm going to go out and try it. And they'll come back and they'll say, you know what, I want a refresher. I want a do-over. And so we allow them to do that do-over. All we ask is just, hey, let's let us know. So make sure we've got room in the class. We've had some very large classes. We just finished this last week with 48 people in the RV maintenance class. And so we had to have it out in the service bay. We had to spread everybody out because of social distancing. But let's just say that you can't come. You can't be there with us. That's okay. When we were traveling on the road a year and a half ago, I guess it was, two, I guess almost two years now when we think about it, we filmed every course that we did over a period of a year. And then we kind of took the best of the best, took the same booklets, the same manuals that we train out of. And then we also give you a flash drive or a thumb drive that you plug into your USB and play it. Now, if you've got good internet access, you don't have to wait for it to be sent to you via priority mail. You can just call in and they can set you up and you can start you can start streaming the material in, taking the course, taking the same material that the people are taking in the class. Unfortunately, most people that we find say, you know, I learned this way, but I really learned better if I can put my hands on it. So what we allow you to do is to buy the home study option, or we you'll also hear it called the tech in the box, you know, just different names for it. But if you'll do this, if you'll purchase it, then what happens is that when you get ready and you want to come to class, you can, to the live class, we're going to give the ability to have a $300 coupon that you can apply to one of your technical classes. Because I need you to come here. I believe that if we can entice you to come to Athens, Texas, we can spend time with you, showing you the programs that we have. And if you want to know more, just go over to the nrvta.com website and just see all the different classes. Because we have the RV maintenance classes five days, and from there, people spin off and go become inspectors. And some people say, no, no, I want more training, and they'll go take four additional classes, a week of air conditioners, a week of refrigerators, a week of furnaces and water heaters, and a week of slide outs, running gear, and roof systems called the exterior system. So a lot of people will go this route. They'll get the tech box because they say, I can't come right now, but I, I want to learn because we've taken this material and we broke it up into bite-sized modules. So that way, maybe if you're still having to work or you're, you know, got some time constraints on you, then you can watch it. They're usually from eight to about 18 minutes long, the segments are. And so you've got it all on the, either on the thumb drive or the internet access. These are the instructors that teach here. Every one of these individuals have been in this industry and been with us and have field experience. The gentleman right here in the center with the maroon colored shirt, the little guy, that's what we always call him. His name is Leon Booth. Leon Booth owns a mobile service company out in West Texas. And he teaches our air conditioning, refrigerators, and uh, water heaters and furnaces. 
And like I told him when he came with us, because I've known, matter of fact, Leon started out in our class and then he's, he became a technician. And now he told me the other day, he said, I've got four service trucks. We're running, we're staying busy. He said, but I really enjoy coming and teaching and spending time with the students because I always learn things from them. And like I told him, I said, Leon, the reason why you're so valuable to us, yes, you've got the book knowledge, but you have the field knowledge. There's stuff that he sees out there that is not in any textbook, okay? And then you got Todd Henson on the far left-hand side. Todd is a master certified technician. He uh, will teach, I'm having him teach primarily the RV maintenance class. He would be the one if you came and spent that first five days with us. Uh, very, very sharp. He's uh, also is going to be handling the solar program for us. I mean, he is all over that solar stuff. It's just solar this, solar that, you know? Now, the gentleman in the center there holding that purple monkey, his name is Craig Johnson. Craig Johnson is who we call the, and this is, believe it or not, that's his his uh, email address, the generator guru. This guy, I'm astounded how anybody can pack that kind of information about generators and the engines, but he is, has put together the generator program for us. That is a six-day program for us, but very, very savvy. He worked for one of the major manufacturers. Uh, then he moved over and went, then moved down to Austin, Texas, and, and was running service calls for, for one of those big companies. And he called me up and said, Cooper, he said, I, I enjoy what I'm doing, but I'd like to I'd like to kind of slow it down a little bit. And I said, Craig, we need to get you in the ranks here because you got all this knowledge. It's not in the manuals, but you're seeing stuff and experiencing stuff. And then you have Howard and Pam. You know, they teach the RV inspector business. They teach the advanced class to show you how to use software and how to scope an RV and what to look for in these things. And of course, yours truly on the far end. I tell you what, guys, it's grown from a long time ago where I taught all of the classes. Now we have these subject matter experts. And I just want to tell you, come join us. We'll help you. Now, we are different than probably any other school you would have ever seen. We believe in hands-on training, but we also know that many people have uh, bad cases of test anxiety. So what we offer the students, you, when you come to class, when you go to take your exam, because there'll be an exam after every class, when you go to take your exam, you can take your exam orally, it's where it's read out to you and you mark your pages, or you can take it written. Then as you move through the process and you get your certifications, because we offer registered certified technicians, certified RV technicians, and then also master certified. Well, here again, there's a lot of people out there that are super techs, take stuff apart, put it back together. They just struggle sometimes in the reading and the taking the test. So here again, why not do the oral? It's no big deal. So what we do is we split everybody up, say, okay, guys, this is the written exam over here, and this is the, the oral. Doesn't matter which class you go in, you're going to take the same exam. And one of the instructors, we have an instructor in each classroom that administers it to you. So if you're one of those individuals that learns best with your hands, oral may be the way to go. Never know. We're also finding that folks that have that are bilingual, that maybe English is not their second language, the oral works real well for them as well. Okay. So, if you're ready for a fresh start and you want to help yourself, but you know, you want to help others, you want to play it forward, here's a chance. So, whether you want to become a certified technician, or you want to be an inspector, or you just want to learn how to work on your own unit. We have a lot of people come and take classes with us, and they don't even own an RV, and they said, I want to learn before I buy. And sometimes I think they're the best buyers because... They know what they're looking for and they understand and they're, and they're not so hung up so much in the emotional because they say, I want to look at this thing from a different perspective. So come spend time with us and we'll help you. We'll show you so much more with the refrigerator, so much more with the air conditioners and all the other appliances. So as we say here in Athens, Texas, all roads lead to Athens and we'll be looking for you. Mr. Awesome Anderson. job, Mr. Cooper. Awesome job. I tell you, you have stirred up the questions like you wouldn't believe. Uh-oh. So, yeah, <laughs> fasten your seatbelt, uh, grab your grab your Diet Coke and your Twinkies, because here we go. <laughs> oh, where's my Oreos? Where's my Oreos? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, there's been a couple folks ask some general questions about uh, how do I defrost or what's a technique for defrosting non-residential refrigerators and especially the freezer compartment 
Okay, guys, these refrigerators do not have a defrost. So a couple of things you got to make sure before you start trying to do something. Before you start doing the defrost, make sure that you cure the problem. Now, the some of this just by the very nature, probably where you're staying is causing it. So if you have a lot of high humidity, every time you open that freezer and you close it, you've let warm, moist air in there. And so what happens is that warm, moist air, first place it starts going to is the back wall. If you have seals, the gaskets around the door, and they're leaking air, then what will happen is they'll begin, they'll be icing up fi faster. But if everything's good, you're, you can say you can pull a dollar bill through those gaskets, or those seals on those doors, and everything you know, kind of drags as you pull it through. Everything seems to be good. Then what we're going to recommend that you do is take you a hair dryer. Now, you're not going to put this thing on high heat because the liner inside this deep freeze is a very thin piece of plastic. And if you really lay the heat on it, you'll warp it and blister it. However, if you'll take you some towels, you have to keep, you get all the food out of that freezer and put you some towels down in the bottom and take that hair dryer and just move it back and forth, back and forth on low heat and just peel off the chunks. That's going to be the easiest way to do this. Now, you'll hear some people say, well, I take a pan of hot water and I put it in there and, and it works. I, Lady East talked to people about doing that. Only problem is I hate to handle a big old bowl of hot water trying to get it in the fridge. And then after I get it, it goes cold and I got to move it back to the sink and you know how things get spilled. So I like to use a hairdryer, but you just just keep in mind it's imperative that you not lay the heat on those walls of that refrigerator too long because you will blister and there's no way to replace it. It's molded on there, okay? But the hair dryer and towels in the bottom are the best way to defrost these, these uh, deep freezes. All right, uh, Jerry asked the question. He states, he says he has a grand design with a Dometic two-door. Okay. It's been suggested that the vent outside the trailer has a construction panel that protrudes up into the vent area but it blocks the air from getting in. Is it supposed to be there? Oh, wow. So it's limiting how much air you get in down at the bottom? That's the way it sounds. Wow, yeah, you do need, Jerry, you're gonna have to do something because you gotta get that airflow. If you can't, if it's, if it's say like it's a, a wall or something that you can't cut and, 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 and get it out of the way, you may have to think about putting some fan assist, maybe some extra those little computer fans. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, the company that you, you can order these off, it, Amazon will have them because they're 12 volt little computer fans and they're, you know, they're calling them refrigerator fans. There's also a company called Pines RV, P-I-N-E-S, and they Pines Refrigeration, RV Refrigeration. You Google it, but what you do is you just take those little fans and what you're going to do on the bottom, you're going to turn them to where they're sucking air in, forcing the air up. Because you're right, you've got to have airflow across that because that's that's the most critical thing because if you don't get rid of the heat, you can't go get more heat. So if, if there's any way that construction panel could be moved without interfering with the structure or you know a back of a cabinet or whatever, um, you, you get that thing out of there so that way you can get the airflow. If you can't, then a fan's going to be the only way. You've got to increase the airflow across that back, those back coils. All right, Mr. Cooper, I kind of wondered about Jerry's question when he asked it, because the way he phrased it, he made it sound like it was in the lower part because it said up into the vent. What he actually wanted to say was it's at the top, not at the bottom. Okay, so there's a piece of probably paneling and stuff at the top. Jerry, I need you to, to take that upper panel loose and look at it and see where it's positioned. That panel should go up up against that the condenser coil, you know, that coil that was up at the top. Now, they give you a one inch spectrum. They say it can either be a half inch below those fins or a half inch above the bottom. Now, this is just personal opinion and personal preference. I'd rather have the fins laying, I'd rather have the piece of paneling or construction material laying on the fins no more than a half inch from the bottom of the fins. So that way, as things kind of get a little distorted from heat, then they're laying there up against those fins. So what's happening is it sounds like, and then this is why I want you to check it and make sure that there's no more than a half inch below those 
those fins that that construction material is coming up there. Because what it's trying to do, it sounds like that the Grand Design folks put that in there to help baffle and throw that air outward so that way you can get that heat out. Now, Mr. Anderson, I'm going to back up to a previous slide to see if we can kind of add to that if you don't mind, sir. I'm trying to make you guys dizzy, but let's see. Okay. All right, Jerry, if you'll notice in this picture on the left-hand side, you see where it says lower vent and then it's got that green arrow that turns and goes straight up. What it's actually doing is, let's see if I can move this. No, I can't move it. There's actually a baffle. And if you'll see, it's, it's almost touching the bottom of the condenser coils. So your piece of construction material has got to make sure that it comes no more than a half inch below and no more than a half inch above above the bottom of those condenser fins. So that way the air is forced up through those black fins, those condenser fins. Notice how it rolls and see how you've got that slanted piece on top of the refrigerator going to the vent. So what we're doing is we're channeling that air across those coils and then forcing it right out. So take a look at your unit and see how the, the uh, it sounds like you've got paneling because that's typically what Grand Design will do. They'll they'll take some paneling and they'll turn it towards raw wood out and then and put it on those fins. But many times they don't always realize that they put it too low or too high and it's going to block the air. So the most efficient way is like what you're seeing here in this picture right here. All right, Mr. Cooper. Um, Steve asked the question, he says, is it worthwhile to shade outside of your refridge and also steve asked along the same similar lines what should be done on a yearly maintenance schedule for your refrigerator okay the two things steve you're spot on about it getting some shade on that um you know obviously most natural of course is tree shade and everything but that's not always optional always the option we have uh, we have stayed out in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona, and done classes, and I have seen people literally take some of the uh, awning material or some of the shade material that you can buy down at office, let's see, um, Home Depot or Lowe's, and actually attach it up above the, the top vent and then run it at an angle so that way it creates a little shade effect. We even saw an, a guy that had taken an umbrella and had duct taped that sucker to the side of that that slide out box, creating shade, particularly for the bottom lower vents. It's kind of ugly, but I saw where the man was coming from. He was just trying to create some shade. So that way that air going in is cooler than the air going out. Uh, you'll see a lot of folks that will do, they'll take the uh, window awnings, you know, they have, you see on motorhomes where it pulls, they will mount it many times between the two vents, the lower and the upper vent, and attach it to the wall, and they have that pull strap, so that way the awning, you know, because it's usually only, what, 36, maybe 42 inches wide, and they pull it, and it creates a shade for the, the lower vent, so yes. Maintenance. Uh, if you've got an air compressor and an air hose, I'm going to recommend that you go in. The first thing you want to do is go on the back side of these refrigerators and clear out the cobwebs and the dust and all that other stuff. Then also go over to the burn assembly. And there's, depending on which brand, uh, Dometic has a long, narrow burner assembly. And so they've got one little screw holding a piece of sheet metal on it that exposes the burner. Take that little screw out. Don't lose it and uh, then take your air hose and blow all that stuff out. And if you happen to have a, a Norcold, then their box, their little burner box is square looking. Here again, they use like a quarter inch uh, hex head screw to hold it in place. So you'd want to take that loose so you get to the burner assembly and just take an air hose and blow it out. When I was working as a service manager, we used to run a special for $79.95. You can bring your RV in and we would give you maintenance. And that's basically what I would do is I'd give my newbie tech, say, go out here, here's the tools, blow out, show them how to do, how to blow out the burner assembly, get all the rust and the old flaky paint and all that other stuff, bugs out of there and put it back and then say, okay, get up on that roof and find, and, you know, we'd give them a list for him to go inspect because the, it was a come on. I, be real honest with you, if people didn't do maintenance on the refrigerator, they probably didn't do maintenance elsewhere. And I put him on the roof and say, okay, write these things up, take pictures. And so when the client comes in, we'll show them the other maintenance that needs to be done. So many times that $79.95 could turn into a $400, $500, $600 bill easy because there were other things that need to be maintained. 
Now, some of you folks are looking for a side business. Let me just tell you, there are people out there that that's all they do is seal roofs, make sure things are good up there, wash them, clean them, clean out refrigerators, and just keep things maintained. Water heaters, same thing. So it's just a matter of just a little maintenance cleaning. All righty, sir. All right, David asked the question. He says, are Atwood fridges much different, and do you teach on these also? Okay, Atwood, since they've been bought out by Dometic, um, the the good thing about the Atwood is that they saw that hydrogen, because of its flammability and the problems we were having with the refrigerators, they went with helium. Now, the refrigerators on the back, they look the same. They've got some idiosyncrasies about their heating elements are a little different and some things. They even have a sensor built in to where if the unit's unlevel, it won't even allow it to operate. Uh, at this time, I'm not aware of Dometic building any of the helium refrigerators. So there's a bunch of them out there that were built by Atwood before Atwood was purchased by Dometic. So yeah, I mean, you look at them, they look the same on the back, they look the same on the front. It's just the, the engineers thought some things through. And like I say, they, they got a little bit larger heating element they're using. Uh, some of the electronics, like I said, the out of balance or out of, out of level things, but that's really the only big thing, difference between Atwood and, and Dometic, or even Atwood and, and what Norcol was. But like I say, Atwood's really not, not in the business anymore because they got bought out by Dometic. All right, uh, David also asked the question, is, is there a particular fridge fan maker brand that you recommend? Man, you know, all this stuff's coming in from China. And there's really not. You just you just want something that operates off of 12 volts. So two little wires coming off of that thing, so you could hook it up. Most of the refrigerators being built today are come with a set of fans. And if you need to add extra fans to kind of move more air, then you can, and uh, just hook them onto that the wire that's feeding off of that little thermal switch that goes down. And then it, that wire goes down to the to the circuit board. So there's not. But like I say, go online, Amazon, and they'll. The medic likes to make a bigger fan, use a bigger fan than Norco does. They're, you know, just a little more blocky. So depending on the brand that you have, but Amazon's a good place. Some of the RV dealers are good places to go and get them. And then I say Pines RV. Guys, I don't even know those guys, but I, you know, I've purchased things from them and they seem to be real good and seem to be very knowledgeable. All right. How about uh, David also threw in, he says, how about the inside fridge fans that you talked about? Is there anything particular there brand wise? Uh, here again, it's it's one of those aftermarket things. You can find those. Uh, there's, I'm trying to remember some of the brands that I've seen. There's a little white one that the fan's on the side, and you got that little blue one we were looking at. Now, Pines also makes a unit. It's a series of little fans, like three or four fans, and you mount them directly underneath the fins of the refrigerator. And what they do is they suck that that heat from the bottom or suck that cold and push it pull it up to those fins but that's kind of one of those aftermarket things one of those diy things but they if you go over and look at their website or maybe even google it because i know i've seen some of the stuff and they had it on ebay and amazon that you can buy those little fans and you go in there and you attach them and then you hook them onto some of the wiring uses like the um the light on the inside of the refrigerator there's a, some wiring there if you get in front of that switch where it's still hot you know, still got power coming to it. You can run those fans off of that. All right, Charlie's asked uh, about two or three questions and they're, it's wrapped around. He says, is the reason some RVer, RVers are replacing fridges with more of the regular home fridge for, is it because of storage reasons? Well, I can tell you about the Coopers. Uh, Lady E wanted it. And that was the big thing. But you're right. When you look at the space you have there, you can actually put a bigger residential refrigerator in there than you could put the RV style. So where you maybe would have only had room to put, say, like a 10 cubic feet or a 12 cubic foot refrigerator, you might be able to put a much bigger house type refrigerator in because there's you don't have the space for the coils. Now, things that always play into it is what's your lifestyle. Because uh, I have a lot of folks that will do repairs on and and you look at them and you say, ooh, you know, you just know they can't afford the $1,800 or 
$2,000 or whatever it is to replace the refrigerator. And I'll usually ask the question, said, look, are you guys living in the RV as your home and you stay plugged into power all the time? Or do you do a lot of boondocking where you go off the grid? And based on their answer determines whether or not you recommend that you put in another RV style refrigerator or a residential. If they're one of the individuals that live in it, that's their home, and maybe they work for on the road and they just go from RV park to RV park, a residential is the way to go. It's so much cheaper, less expensive, and they can get more more refrigerator for the bank for the money for the money. But if you're one of those individuals that needs to live off the grid or you want to run solar, then you know, then take a look at going with the RV because now you have propane. You also have the 120 volts as well. Um, obviously, if you're going to go the house type, you're, you know, you're probably going to need an, an inverter. So there's some other things that play into the, the thing. But you're right. It's it, it, one of the reasons why some people go and make the change out is because they want more space. Um, you know, it's just personal preference. It really is. All right. Well, Charlie's considering buying a larger fridge, and I think you've already, I think you responded to this already. But let me throw the question out there. Okay. So, is it the technology of the RV fridge? Is that the reason the cost is so much more? You know, it, it's really not so much the technology. It's uh, they just don't produce enough of them. I mean, I heard the other day that the medic was cranking out. I don't know, was it 4,000 units a day, and they're still not keeping up? Well, and then you go over here and you look at, you know, all these different manufacturers that can put, you know, a fancy three door that has a bottom chest that pulls out for the freezer and, and everything. And of course, you know, you can buy that refrigerator for say $2,500. That same space refrigerator in an RV style might run you $4,500 or $5,000. So, you know, sometimes you think, hmm, price can always be a big thing on it. Yeah. All right, Bruce asks, uh, could you repeat what the temperature should be inside the refrigerator? Uh, let's see if I can't find that slide. We'll just bring it up for you here. There we go, right there. Now, guys, on the refrigerator, on that front grill, see you see those aluminum fins. Now, looking at the picture, you can see the freezer, and then you see the refrigerator. You see those aluminum fins sticking out? That shelf is where you want to put your, your uh, thermometer. Lady E she would go down to Walmart or one of those places and she would buy one of those little thermometers that would hang on that shelf. And when she could open the refrigerator door to check on things, she would look at it and see what it said. But what she would buy would be a horizontal type of, of thermometer so you could see what it was. But guys, realistically, the manufacturers say that, you know, 48 degrees is okay. Well, like I said, Lady E says, uh-uh, because, -uh, you know, we all know once you start getting above that 41, 42, 43 degrees, things start kind of thawing out a little bit and start deteriorating. So this is the ideal range for these things to work in. All right, here's a here's a situational agenda that uh, Susan is throwing out here and wants uh, your opinion. She says, I was recently on a camping trip and after a couple of days, the fridge stopped working on both propane and AC. When we returned home, the mobile RV tech came and hardwired the fridge for a day, which bypassed the front panel controls. The fridge started working again. What did hardwiring it actually do to get this thing to work? <laughs> uh, what he probably did was is he, he bypassed all the controls and basically hooked that heating element more than likely, uh, to an electric power cord, an extension cord. Now, do you know if he just hardwired it to electric, or did it also work on propane at that time? Do we know? Because usually when they hardwire like that, they basically unplug the heating element, and they plug it into an extension cord and plug the extension cord into the wall. So basically what you're doing is you're just running that heating element full tilt, because what he was doing was he was checking to see if those cooling coils were working. because giving him the symptoms that you gave him, it made him think, okay, maybe the cooling coils are bad because it doesn't cool on propane, it doesn't cool on, on electric. So what he did was he, he forced one of the options to work to see if the cooling coils cooled. So did she say that, Susan say that it, it did cool when they got back? Susan said that he hardwired it to electric. Okay, so did it cool, I wonder, after he, after he hardwired it? 
Uh, she said that it it did. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what he just did, he that guy, you better hang on to that tech. He just saved you about half the pr well to replace a set of coils is usually about half the price of a new one. So he just saved you a set of coils is what he did. Now let's see what he see how good a tech he is now. Now he starts dialing in on it. So it sounds like it's some sort of thermostat control it could be the circuit board it could be the thermistor inside so let's see how this guy does but I applaud him for doing the diagnostic he did because that's how you do it you just let's eliminate let's find out what's going on because think about it if he hardwired that and made that heating element come on and the refrigerator still did not cool then that tells us that what's common it's the cooling coil so he saved you some money so you're in good shape so far. I wouldn't leave it plugged in very long because that thing's running all the time, never shutting down. But he, uh, I'll give the guy credit. He, he kind of acted like he knew what he was doing there. That's awesome. Well, Mr. Cooper, you have done a phenomenal job. And uh, I want to finish up just by giving some kudos to, uh, we've got some of our folks that have been through our classes on. Uh, uh, you remember Martina? She's on today, so you can shout well, out to her. <laughs> yeah, we haven't heard from Martina for a while. And no, we Donna haven't. Pat, Donna Pat's on with us. And Donna and Pat are always great advocates. Uh, they're sharing that, uh, especially if you're going full time, you can easily recoup your investment from the training of that first week course. And as as most people will tell you, they, they recoup it very quickly. Even part even part timers uh, receive enough information to make it worth their time and their money. So thanks, Don and Pat, for for those kind words. Well, Mr. Cooper, I want to thank you. You have done a phenomenal job as usual, and I want to make sure that people understand that the Right from the Horse's Mouth series is available to them. They can find it on the NRVTA YouTube channel as well as on the Work Camper News YouTube channel. And uh, for the folks that registered for this presentation, uh, you will also be getting an email that'll have the link. So you don't even have to go diving for it. It'll show up right in your inbox. So any last words before we finish up today? No, other than just come hang out with us and we'll spend some time together. Um, I'd like you to be part of the family. And what better way to come and spend time and get to know other people that you've never met before, but you all have the same thing in common. You are RVers. So come spend time, learn. And so that way you take that fear away. Because if you understand how things work, that fear fades away. All right, Mr. Cooper. Thank you for presenting this uh, rendition of Right from the Horse's Mouth. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Again, when we have another version coming your way. So we'll finish up today and we'll see all of you down the road. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye, guys.